Hi there, everyone. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be here at FOSS Backstage. I was talking to uh, Paul and Isabel and other organizers and saying, it's hard to believe this is the first time that FOSS Backstage has been held. It feels more like a conference that has been running for a while. The audience is diverse, networking with each other. The speakers are interesting and represent a wide range of views. It's a conference that I think out of the gate looks good, sounds good, and I will certainly be telling people about it. Now, my keynote today is about how we run open source, not from a development perspective, not even from a business perspective per se, but rather from the perspective of how do we manage the collaboration in this type of community. I'm a political scientist, so I look at issues like open source community with a slightly different perspective to many of the people who come from engineering or pure business backgrounds. I'm interested in how do we take the complexity of human social dynamics create a situation where parties who don't know each other and have no natural reason to trust each other can nevertheless collaborate on technology. For me, open source is particularly interesting because it is a method of collaborating that we haven't seen happen elsewhere as successfully. Open source has provided a way for tens of thousands or perhaps even hundreds of thousands of individuals around the world to collaborate on shared technology platforms with a relatively high degree of confidence that what they give and what they get is predictable and fair. Now this brings me to the topic of open source governance, open source compliance, ensuring that people follow the rules. In my view, we're a long way from the point in open source where we were discussing, is this license valid? Or how do I enforce this license? Or should I obey the license? We're in a situation with open source where now people quite clearly understand that we have a certain set of rules codified in copyright that set a tone that set a way of interacting that allows us to build shared platforms. This is now a well-established and well-accepted fact for collaborators or participants of all sizes, from individuals through to multinational corporations. We've seen the acceptance of licenses using copyright law as the correct and balanced way to ensure fairness in open source. The fact that we now all agree that the licenses work and we agree that we will follow them doesn't mean that our challenges around open source governance are over. It means that we have a good solid baseline, a great starting point. But we still have plenty of questions along the lines of, okay, so now we know what the rules are and we know where the rules are located in the licenses. How do we, in practical senses, implement these rules in different areas? But for example, I live in Japan, and in Japan there are large automotive companies that are using open source. And these companies essentially have a model of doing a lot of R&D, then having their suppliers build a lot of technology, and then the automotive company assembles the technology. So in, in some ways, and this is a little bit frivolous, but also not inaccurate, modern car manufacturers are research and integration experts, with their supply chain doing a lot of the building. For companies like this, they look at the supply chain, they look at dozens or hundreds of companies involved in bringing a car to completion, and they ask questions along the lines of, okay, so people are following the license, that's great, but how do we communicate that through the supply chain? 
How do we ensure that each company, while they're doing the right thing, can communicate what they've done clearly to the customers throughout the supply chain? Those types of governance questions, quite frankly, seemed burdensome or difficult to resolve. It took us quite a few years of trying to work this out before we settled on the simple idea that maybe we can help everyone meet the requirements by having standards, and those standards can be clearly and predictably communicated to participants. For a while, every company was trying to do their own thing. They were recording their progress in documents like spreadsheets. They were doing things like scanning code and hoping that was enough to verify that their development process had covered all the bases. When we began to think of the problem differently, when we began to think, how do we ensure multiple parties, multiple legal entities, can communicate the information with fidelity, without losing data, without misunderstandings. We began to understand clearly that every company putting things in a spreadsheet and sending it onward was making stuff harder, more complex, and less accurate. We turned our minds to building an industry standard that would explain roughly what the key requirements of a quality open source program must be and how you can meet those requirements. That's where OpenChain came from. It, it originated in a conversation between a handful of lawyers. And the conversation was basically that the companies, as customers of large supply chains, the companies knew what they wanted from open source, but their suppliers didn't necessarily have the processes in place to deliver that. So, these lawyers sat down and began to draft some universal requirements for open source compliance. Simple requirements like, do you have an inbound software process? Do you have a development process? Do you have a policy? Do you have an outbound process? Simple questions that if you answer yes to, by and large, your organization will be able to manage open source licenses. And of course, you can answer this question. If you can manage the licenses, you can trust what's going on. The Open Chain standard started a few years ago and has grown relatively quickly with very large companies, particularly in areas like enterprise technology, automotive, and consumer devices picking up on the idea of having a shared approach to governance to reduce complexity, to reduce investment required, and to reduce mistakes. Now, this talk is entitled Complex Made Simple. And the reason for that is that I believe in 2018, we have a lot of talking points around open source compliance and governance. We have certain issues. Uh, like we've seen enforcement in Germany that has caused some disruption in our industry. Uh, this has been discussed by the Linux kernel and NetFilter teams in the past. We've seen new participants entering open source, entering software, who are learning from scratch about what to do. And we've seen some interesting, not to say tensions, but moments of evolution as our community as a whole changes. And as all of this has been going on, we've had some dialogue suggesting that governance in open source is somehow lacking or somehow too complex or somehow different from how we deal with, let's say, proprietary software. This perception of complexity is something that has caused us to pause and reconsider how we're doing things. How do we try to reduce the perception of complexity to ensure that people using open source are confident? How do we make things simpler? Not by reducing the fidelity of something like governance or the fidelity of compliance, 
but by prepackaging as much of it as possible. As my American colleagues might, might say, pre-chewing it as much as possible. So we've been doing that. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the Linux Foundation's open compliance program. Linux Foundation has gradually started to make a large stack of projects and solutions to address governance and compliance. OpenChain as an overarching standard is perhaps at the top of the stack. Just below it, there's another standard called SPDX that explains how you can describe what's in a package in a consistent manner so that everyone can quickly read, understand, and also share their data. Below that, there's projects like Fossology for scanning code. Outside of Linux Foundation, there are also other interesting projects. Uh, one new project that started recently is Quartermaster. Uh, Mirko is right there. He's running it. That's a CI CD project. Another project that was recently released by a group of people, but particularly the Microsoft open source team, is Clearly Defined, which is a type of software catalog. And surrounding these various projects with standards and tools, we've got dozens and dozens of publications that explain what's going on, how you can do it too, and how you can train and educate the people in your organization using open source. We're very close to making the complex question of open source governance simple. We're very close to being able to say, OK, go here, and you'll be walked through the answers to your questions. I'd say that during 2018, you can expect that capability to become live. Right now, I'm working on the Open Compliance Program website at Linux Foundation with other members of the team. And admittedly, we won't be announcing the new website until November, but pre-announcements never hurt. What we're looking at is having a way to say, are you a developer? Are you a company? Or are you a project? And when you click through that, you find all of the information available that can help you frame your thinking and solve challenges related to governance. Now, I run OpenChain, which is one of many projects. But I do think that if you watch OpenChain, you'll be able to keep track of how we're making the complexity and governance a lot simpler. There's our URL. And the reason that OpenChain is a good place to keep track of things is that we are only a standard and some reference material, but we point outwards to everything else. And because we're on the top of the stack, we're pointing out to all of the interesting projects around the place. So hopefully, we'll be playing an instrumental role in tying things together and making governance as simple as possible. Now, switching gears. Uh, I talked about how open source governance is doing pretty well, how we're making standards, how we're beginning to make it easier to interact with your supply chain and to interact with the projects around you. At the same time as all of this rosy news about everything going really well, I think it's worth highlighting that sometimes we do face interesting challenges. I briefly mentioned the challenges in the German legal jurisdiction with uh, compliance cases. In a challenging situation there was that uh, we saw a whole bunch of legal claims against companies that did not really seem to be motivated by ensuring compliance, but rather focused on a profit motive. And that caused some concern, disruption, and uncertainty in our community. We also see challenges coming in other areas. I mentioned that companies which have nothing to do with open source, or maybe nothing to do with software in the past, have begun adopting open source technology. Uh, just uh, two months ago, I was talking to a very large company involved in consumer products, uh, consumable consumer products. And this company never used open source. In fact, it was focused on business to business until recently. And with their new product range, they're pivoting their business to customer, and their back end is all open source. 
In the case of this particular company, they took a very wise, well-informed and careful approach whereby they actually looked at the community carefully and then decided to adopt the community norms, projects and methodologies to reduce their time to market. But there are other companies which are new to open source who arrive in a state of uncertainty and without clarity of what they should do and they naturally make mistakes. That's a, a slight concern for our community because if we don't reach out and support these organizations, if they have a bad experience using open source, they might not continue. And finally, we have challenges because open source itself is truly evolving, becoming much larger than the individual's programming code, becoming much larger than any company investing in it. This change has meant that, to some extent, the old method of working with huge figureheads and these inspirational, inspirational figureheads guiding the community is reducing in favor of having much larger communities with formal rule sets. And that, that process of adjustment is not always smooth and it does lead to some tensions. And th these three things, uh, can lead to serious concerns around governance and predictability. At the very beginning of my talk, I mentioned that open source is a method of interacting. It's a method of people working together. And if we have uncertainty, if we have tensions, if it's about lawsuits or companies who don't know what to do, or the tension of communities evolving, if the rules become uncertain, if the confidence and trust fostered by those rules become uncertain, we lose efficiency, we lose the ability to collaborate. And that truly is one of my great concerns and one of the areas I think we can make a great difference in governance. The complexity of something like lawsuits or the complexity of teaching companies how to use open source or the complexity of managing community transitions are something that we are investing in right now. Rather than neglecting this or waiting thing for things to hit a problem point, we're proactively investing in the projects like OpenChain that are designed to catch people, give them a frame of reference, point them at solutions, and allow them to look at the other organizations around them and feel confident those organizations are doing the same thing. To end my keynote, I perhaps would like to set the tone for the future. Free software, open source, if there's one criticism that can be leveled against it, is that this area, not just in the last 10 years, perhaps since inception, is quite inward looking we tend to look in at what we regard as the core of our community. We tend to look at the technologies that perhaps we created a very long time ago and still regard them as central, not from a perspective of utilitarian solution or benefit, but with a sort of emotional attachment. This inward looking nature means that our community can be so, so close People can arrive at an event and feel welcomed instantly as long as they know the secret handshake. But this insular nature also presents us with perhaps the greatest challenge to governance in open source. We are now software. Everything that is software contains open source. But the reason open source succeeded wasn't passion. It wasn't because of a normative good or bad. It was because it worked best. It solved more problems for more people more efficiently. And if we remain too inward looking in open source, if we continually self-reference ourselves, if we continually hold various items, for example, not to pick a particular text editor, but text editors which are decades old and regard them as sacrosanct simply because they exist. 
If we get stuck inside ourselves, we might miss the terrific opportunities of the future. And by those opportunities, I mean things like the massive advances coming in artificial intelligence, the massive, massive advantages and developments coming in structure, infrastructure, automotive, areas that we are going to make a huge impact as software, <clears throat> but we perhaps need to be a little bit more open and inclusive to make an impact as a community. One thing I hope, and I would like to put out to you as an idea today, is that in our community, it might be a really good time for us to go back and think some of the ways that we've governed open source for decades are working well. The fundamentals codified in the licenses, that's working well. But some of the other aspects of the open source community, the pre-assumption that we're dominated by individual hackers doing amazing things, or the pre-assumptions dominated that a particular license type is inherently more advantageous than another, these ideas might bear some reflection and perhaps adjustment. We might benefit from new books talking about how the open source community today is so vibrant, talking about why, for example, in China, Baidu released uh, autonomous car software as open source last year. Things like that are incredible accomplishments. They're wonderful examples of how the open source community is growing and evolving. We just need perhaps a little bit more documentation about that. And given that you all have so much experience, I think my call to you would be to consider being part of that, you know, blogging about what's happening around our community today, what's happening in society, and how open source fits into that. So, uh, internally in open source are basic questions of license compliance, how to work together. We're doing fine. And during this year in particular, you'll get some great information about how projects, companies, and individuals can address open source top to bottom on the compliance and governance side. Pulling back on the bigger picture of governance about community and society, we might need to reflect a little bit about how things have changed in the last 30 years and where we might benefit from new essays, new books, new inspirations to help ensure that our community today supports the outside community and brings them in as best possible for tomorrow. So thank you very much for your time and your attention. I really appreciate it. And I'm around this event at any time if you have questions or comments. And also now, I believe, we have a minute or two for questions. So I did see my MC wildly waving a placard. So, yeah, please firstly thank to Shane Coglan. Thank you. And we still have a couple of minutes maybe for questions since we have a delay of like five maximum to ten minutes to every session till the lunch. So I'm coming for the question. So we have a question from this gentleman. Please. Shane, first of all, um, before I come up with my question, I really like to thank you. Uh, what you're doing with Open Chain uh, brings uh, some kind of the light of uh, the end of a dark tunnel to us. Uh, before these initiatives, uh, for for us as a company using open source, um, was split it in a part that is very transparent, and that's the code. And on the other side, this legal part, very on the dark side of. Even if we try to talk to other companies, they say oh, we will not tell you how we handle this, and this is not uh, the way o open source should be. So really. Thank you for this initiative. And um, now my question, what is your wish? How can we all support these initiatives to b bring open source, make it completely transparent on the code side and on the legal side? So what can we all do? It's a really good question and a valuable question. 
sometimes we do face a situation where people come to our community and they, they say, that, that's great, what do I do? <laughs> uh, when it comes to improving governance, contributing to the future of that, joining something like the open chain mailing list and contributing to discussions about future specifications is useful. But I think more generally, to help the community at large, getting case studies or getting contributions of reference policies or just reference process outlines is something that we see immediately impacting people. So when Open Chain started, we were focused on the idea of let's make the standard, the specification. And to support it, we made some training slides, reference training slides. And we thought these slides would be used to help meet the specification. But as soon as we put them out there, the slides just went everywhere all over the world. Some people were using it for open chain. A lot of people were using it for other things. They were revamping their internal training programs. They were sending them to their suppliers. There is huge demand in the global open source space for case studies and examples. So that's where you can make the biggest impact and what's interesting is that no matter what that example is, it will be useful. So if a developer makes a quick note about how they, let's say, contribute to a project, that is useful. It's immensely useful. And in some countries like Korea, many companies until recently wouldn't allow their developers to even access services like GitHub. Those were blocked. So now they're unblocking that, but the developers are really just getting up to speed. They're desperate for material to see how they can do things properly. If you go to Open Chain Project and just join our mailing list, you can send in reference material at any time. We're also releasing templates for one page or one uh, presentation slide case studies. These case studies are just crazy useful. They're useful as reference for actual processes, but we also found they're really useful to go and talk to management, which has been one of the very important things. Uh, automotive probably leads the way. Yesterday, Toyota was running an open chain event in Nagoya, and they announced three automotive case studies, which are now on the open chain website. And uh, we, we know that there's another automotive case study coming out today, uh, which is actually going to be Rather than an anonymous case study, it will be a named Toyota case study. And those going out immediately get attention and immediately get pick up. I don't want to go on too long on this point, but Thanks. I would like to talk about just the license related to this. When it came to licensing the material in OpenChain, we put the specification um, under a, a CC license which was relatively restricted so that the standard would be very stable. But we put all of our reference material, all of our training material, everything else under CC0, effectively public domain. And that was critical, I think, in allowing people to adopt it because they could include it in their own company material or their project material. They don't even need to mention where it comes from. And that, that really worked. So thank You're you welcome. for Shane Coughlin again. Thank you.